Good evening. Welcome to Topics. I'd like to introduce my guest this evening, Gene Malov. Welcome to the program, Gene. Welcome. Uh, over the years, uh, Gene has been uh, responsible for lining up a number of our uh, science guests, uh, from Ian Hutchinson and Gordon Pettengill from uh, MIT, and uh, we came across a book, and finally we meet after all these years. Uh, the book is entitled uh, Fire, Fire from Ice, Searching for the Truth Behind the Cold, Cold Fusion Fuhrer. And uh, it's published by John Wiley and Sons Incorporated. And it's a pretty uh, in-depth look at the original uh, and continuing furor around the Pons and Fleischmann claims of uh, uh, discovery of cold fusion out in Utah. Uh, and it's a rather a provocative book in terms of some of the conclusions that you draw and the places that you go relative to this thing not necessarily being uh, what it was portrayed as during the whole furor by the institutions. Uh, so let's, let's try and start from the beginning. First of all, let me uh, uh, give uh, Gene's credentials. He is a graduate of uh, Harvard with a PhD in uh, air pollution control engineering, and he also possesses a BS and master's from MIT in aerospace engineering. Uh, so let's, let's start with uh, briefly fusion, hot and cold, the differences. Hot fusion, which is something that researchers have been pursuing for decades now, about four decades, is the promise of taking hydrogen, special kinds of hydrogen, from the ocean, from any water. Uh, you know, water is H2O, and there's lots of special kind of hydrogen in that water called deuterium, an isotope, a rare form. Putting it together in very high magnetic fields, stripping off the electrons around the atoms, and at millions and millions of degrees, banging these nuclei of hydrogen together to attempt to form things like helium and tritium and so forth. And getting vast bursts of neutrons out, or vast fluxes of neutrons out, which then can be used to, to obtain heat. Okay. Make steam, produce Make light. steam, right. Okay. A new type of nuclear energy, mimicking, in a way, the stars. That's hot fusion. Now, the nearest possible commercial application of this technology is believed, even by its proponents, to be about three decades in the future. And it's a noble quest, and I've been fascinated by it since I was a kid, in fact, and read some of the earliest writings about hot fusion. Now, in 1989, Dr. Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann at the University of Utah in March made a fantastic announcement that everyone was shocked by. They said that in a tabletop experiment using heavy water, which has that hydrogen isotope that I just referred to, and a palladium metal rod and a platinum rod, and passing a current through and getting the deuterium of the heavy water into the palladium, somehow they were able to generate, they claimed, excess power. In other words, more power coming out of the cell in the form of heat than was going in, in terms of the electricity. All right, now that was a remarkable claim. It was certainly something that went far beyond what the hot fusion people had been able to do. And it was in an entirely different environment. And in fact, everyone knew on that very day that if that reaction was really fusion and it was working in the same way that hot fusion was working, then Pons and Fleischmann would be dead. No question about it. Because all the neutrons from that conventional fusion reaction producing watts of power or a fraction of a watt of power would have killed them. No question. So it had to be something else. And in fact, Pons and Fleischmann said in their paper, their first paper, which they regrettably did not release on that very first day, which I fault them for in my book, Fire from Ice, they said they didn't understand it. And in fact, to this very day, we don't fully understand what's going on. But we do know this. Enormous numbers of laboratories now, at least 100, perhaps more, probably more than 100 laboratories around the world have had some degree of positive replication of the pons fleischmann experiment, including heat, including nuclear particles of some kind, such as tritium, uh, neutrons, radiations of various sorts, charged particles. It all adds up to a very suspicious new phenomenon, which is not well understood. But because something is not well understood, I repeat, it does not mean that it doesn't exist. Well, let's not let let's go back a ways now. Okay. And and 
you mentioned earlier that the hot fusion portion of it has been uh, investigated for oh, 30, 40 years, but there's also been hundreds of, upon hundreds of millions of dollars invested in this. Billions. Billions. Uh, now, obviously, the disadvantage or the advantage of fusion versus fission is that uh, there is no uh, uh, the fuel problem. I mean, there is no okay. uh, nuclear problem with waste in terms no, of No, that's not strictly plutonium, true. Plutonium, things of that sort. Not strictly true, but almost true mm -hmm. in the following sense. The main advantage of fusion, whether it's hot fusion or cold fusion, is that the fuel supply is infinite Unlimited. and essentially mm -hmm. free. Now, indeed, it takes a, a gallon of heavy water with, instead of H2O, D2O, with that mm -hmm. special hydrogen isotope that occurs rarely but easily extractable in water. That gallon of heavy water, which would fuel, help to fuel a, uh, either a cold fusion or a hot fusion reactor, costs about $1,000. Mm -hmm. But look at this. In order to, f to fuel a 1,000 megawatt typical size electric power plant, it would require a train about 250 miles long of coal cars. For the year? For the year. Okay. It would require seven super tankers full of oil. It would require about seven or eight tractor trailer full of, of uranium oxide fuel rods. Wow. If it were a, f a fuel, a fission reactor like Seabrook or uh, Yankee, Yankee Row or what have you. Um, if it were a hot fusion reactor or a cold fusion plant, let's presume that we understand that cold fusion may use deuterium, much as hot fusion would use deuterium. We're not absolutely sure, but we're, uh, the scientific community of people who pursue cold fusion are getting to be of the opinion that deuterium is part of the fuel. It would require only a, a pickup truck full mm -hmm. of, For the of heavy water, of a thousand megawatts. Mm -hmm. Now, you said the nice thing about fusion is that it doesn't produce any waste. Hot fusion does produce waste, mm -hmm. but if you want to ballpark it in terms of the relative threat, as it were, in terms of how much radiation, radioactive materials are produced by hot fusion versus current fission power, it's something like a hundredth, one hundredth of the problem. Still a problem, and there are many more problems to hot fusion, by the way, even if it ultimately gets going. Well, let's get to one of the other problems significantly in the design phase, in the magnetic bottle technique, which is currently most popularized, in, in how they're going to hold this mass of, of fused hydrogen that's creating this heat. That is the problem currently now, from an engineering standpoint, in terms of making this thing on a broad scale. The, en the engineering problem is very complex in hot fusion. It involves typically now tokamaks, donut-shaped cavities which are evacuated to very high vacuum and then a small amount of fuel, in th this case deuterium, they also put tritium which is another kind, a radioactive form of hydrogen, mixed together in 50-50 proportion and then scrunched down in various ways with all kinds of complex magnetic fields, electrical fields, uh, radio frequency power that has to be injected to strip the electrons off and so forth. It's a very tricky business, but they have managed to get these systems, these tokamaks, which now number something on the order of 100 have been built around the world as experimental prototypes. They are nearing what you would call break even. That is, as much electrical magnetic power being put in as may come out when they put the final tritium fuel in. However, far from a practical device. The conditions of vacuum, the instabilities in this hundreds of millions of degree plasma, make it a very finicky machine at best. B by the understanding of everybody, no one is denying this for a minute. It's a tough engineering problem. Okay, what I'm setting up here is the basic conflict that arises. Mm -hmm. We have all of these enormous complex yes. problems relative to hot fusion, all of this enormous amount of money and mm -hmm. great brain power that's dedicated to it, then along, physicists primarily, right. then along come two chemists from the University of Utah. And the University of Southampton in England. Right. Uh, was Pons. Uh, Ma Ma Martin Fleischmann. The other one. And, and say that uh, all, we've, dis we've gotten these results basically out of a beaker on the top of a yep. table in a, in a mm -hmm. laboratory. So from day one, the other side is going to be skeptical. 